So we're, we're going to move on to a, a different topic, and that's hydrocephalus. And, I, and, I, and I'll say that I, I think few would argue with the, the fact that in no other disease entity in pediatric neurosurgery has endoscopy made such a, uh, a, an impact in, in the treatment of hydrocephalus versus anything else. Um, we're going to talk about uh, two elements of that, and I want to be considerate of Dr. Tomali, Uli Tomali, who's joining us from Berlin. He's probably getting ready for dinner soon, but I want to uh, certainly introduce him as the director of pediatric neurosurgery in Berlin at the uh, Charité, who's going to speak to us about a very complex management issue in pediatric hydrocephalus, and that's the compartmentalized hydrocephalus and address the issue of uh, isolated fourth ventricle and compartmentalized hydrocephalus. And Dr. Tamala, are you with us? Yes. So first of all, thank you very much for ha having me. Uh, thank you very much, Mark and Ramin, for inviting me for this uh, quite nice endeavor to this uh, make this kind of conference. And uh, you were giving me the um, opportunity to talk about our experience of the role of neuroendoscopy in pediatric uh, hydrocephalus and especially in trapped uh, ventricles and multilocated hydrocephalus. Um, since I'm talking uh, first, uh, I would just generalize a little bit about classification. There are a lot of papers out there about uh, pathophysiological classifications. I won't get into this topic. But in terms of what we can do, uh, we have, of course, transient uh, treatment methods. We have the endoscopy and we have the shunt. And um, my talk will be majorly, of course, about endoscopy. And there we distinguish between uh, endoscopy alone and combining endoscopy with shunt together. Uh, while in the past, where uh, ETV was only one of the options to use endoscopy treatment for hydrocephalus, which uh, Mark will later talk about, and I will not uh, address this topic at all, uh, there was a lot of competitive issues between shunts and endoscopy. However, today we know that actually there's not a competitive, but more um, an additive value of endoscopy in order to simplify shunts and make shunts better. And uh, this is a very important topic I would like to address. And therapeutic op options, if uh, we looked at the series between quite long ago, already 2010 and 2013, 380 uh, patients, we thought that more than one third of all hydrocephalus procedures in kids were done in our uh, division with endoscopy. So endoscopy definitely plays a very important role in the treatment of hydrocephalus. And I think everybody would agree on this. Um, however, the treatment options are quite different, and I just briefly would like to give you our scheme, uh, how we address hydrocephalus, and this uh, addresses that we always look for communication, yes or no. And if there's no communication, endoscopy takes in place, and ETV is the most valuable um, treatment option with some exceptions like age under um, six months or one year, for example. But if we have no communication, um, if we have communication between the ventricles and the external CSF spaces, shunt becomes more important. But if there are communication issues between the ventricle in terms of um, loculation of the ventricles, then we have to combine endoscopy and shunt together. In tumors, it's a little bit more uh, specific. There we have to do biopsies, sometimes combining with ETV, sometimes combining in metastatic patients with shunts. And then a more specific thing we do a lot here in Berlin is endoscopic lavage uh, in order to either avoid shunts or make shunts better in terms of complication. Endoscopy is also sometimes uh, important if you want to access the ventricle. Um, and we use uh, a small little guide where you can also use navigation or your freehand technique. This guide addresses that there's an individual uh, access in the coronal plane uh, to the uh, from the skull surface to the ventricle, and this can be measured um, in um, an iPhone application, for example. And then with an instrument, you can access the ventricle uh, by using your optic scope through this guide in order to um, access the ventricle without any problems. Um, this has been used, for example, uh, using the shunt scope, uh, which is uh, produced by Storz. And um, we think this is quite useful some, for some kind of uh, indications. And therefore, we put the shunt scope into the ventricular catheter using the guide and then accessing the ventricle and determining intraventricularity with a, a view of the endoscope, the length of the catheter. Um, this seems to be quite valuable. But of course, I would more likely talk, um, like to talk about more complex 
challenging uh, procedures, which is called complex hydrocephalus. And there you can have complete different uh, and individual circumstances of compartmentalization uh, of the ventricles or cysts, which can cause hydrocephalus. And the entry point is of uh, utmost importance in order to optimally reach with the endoscope all these different cavities and to perform either fenestrations between them or to put stents in order to get them uh, communicated. So the aim is accurate planning and guidance, so to find a target, e.g. for fenestrations, or um, respected landmarks um, like foramen of Monroe, and therefore we need to plan trajectories and entry points individually uh, mostly with navigation procedures. And this is uh, how it uh, looks like if we use the navigation in the operation rooms. There we have the camera, which detects the patient as well as the endoscope, and we have a parallel view on our navigation system and the endoscope um, viewing system. Uh, since 2014, we um, used a specific uh, navigation system, which is able to implement augmented reality into the endoscope's view, um, and this uh, is done by not registering the endoscope only in terms of length and diameter, but also in terms of the fish eye uh, view. Uh, and um, with this procedure, uh, you can uh, actually detect the complete view of the uh, endoscope and then implement your targets and your points of fenestration and your trajectories into the view. So you only need to look at one screen and not at two anymore. So to some examples, we can distinguish um, in our complex cases that we use hydrocephalus in shunts, uh, with shunts or without shunts, and we have cysts or tumors also um, addressed with shunts and can cause some kind of uh, multiloculated hydrocephalus. But I will start with isolated ventricles. This is a case of a three-year-old girl, posthemorrhagic hydrocephalus, condition with an isolated lateral ventricle. There's no clear hydrocephalus, but only isolated uh, to the left side of the ventricles. And of course, this is a clear case which can be treated with endoscopy alone. We can do in fenestration at the frame of Monroe uh, and as well as the septum. And here we introduce this um, augmented reality navigation and you have the full screen where you can see actually our trajectories uh, targeting the ventricle at the beginning, and then uh, looking at our targets. Uh, first target would be the membrane, which is at the level of the foramen of Monroe. Um, and this will be opened. I will proceed the video a little bit. It can be opened first with a blunt probe, and then uh, enlarge the fenestration by a Fogati balloon catheter. And then you have the view in the third ventricle. And then the second step would be uh, to do a septostomy, and this can be done in the posterior portion of the septum. Again, you can see here the trajectory leading or guiding us to the target of the uh, point of fenestration. And then uh, we would have uh, our postoperative image where we have actually our uh, points where the foramen of Monroe as well as the septum is perforated and no shunt is needed for this patient. A similar patient, which was actually early, uh, treated with a stent in the same condition, so no shunt in this patient, a five-year-old with isolated posterior horn, uh, initial stent placement, and the tip of the stent was here, so it was growing almost out, uh, and we decided to prolong the stent and then to connect this isolated portion of the posterior horn of the, the left lateral ventricle. And here, first you saw the um, placement of the um, stand. This is the second view, and here's our fenestration point, um, and this will be reopened again in order to get uh, this portion of the ventricle connected, um, again with a blunt probe. We just open it, it uh, to get a large fenestration, um, and in this case, we would not put a stand in this region, but we would replace the stand in the contralateral horn uh, where it was uh, placed before. This would be the stent placement. And these are the post uh, the postoperative images. Here you can see the communication and the stent placement now in the posterior horn of the right ventricle. And uh, no shunt is needed for this patient, just communication between these isolated portions. Um, then, of course, we have um, other isolated parts. The fourth ventricle is one of the more uh, frightening ones because uh, they can be caused by different conditions. 
This is a five-year-old post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus with overdrainage. Uh, so there was not a real high resistant valve implanted, slit ventricles supertentorially, and an isolated uh, fourth ventricle, which de developed later on. And uh, symptoms was like swallowing um, and uh, um, very diverse uh, symptoms. And uh, we actually first did a shunt replacement and increased the resistance of the uh, shunt drainage, and thereby the ventricles were enlarged. And then we planned a, sub, uh, a supertentorial, so a frontal entry point to the ventricle and to perform as a second step surgery in aqueductoplasty. Uh, this technique was earlier described very nicely by Cinali in 2006. And here you can see that the endoscope is looking while the stent is placed and it can be introduced through the aqueduct into uh, the fourth ventricle. It will have perforation holes here and perforation holes here and then connected to a reservoir and then connected to a shunt uh, in order to drain the hydrocephalus. Why to use a stent? Because in 75% of cases which were reported earlier where a stent was not placed, um, the aqueduct was reclosing. So due to this high uh, reclosure rate of the aqueduct, a stent is needed to uh, open or to keep the aqueduct open. Um, to plan this entry point is very important. We always look for the trajectory, which is actually in line of the aqueduct itself. And then we prolong this trajectory to the surface of the skull. And this would be our entry point, which can be located then by navigation, for example. We use uh, perforation uh, catheters, which have only limited holes. So we try to avoid any perforation holes at the level of the aqueduct in order to get any uh, problems or occlusion at this level. And here you have the video. Uh, where you can see that the endoscope is uh, going into the ventricle and uh, is looking at the tip of the um, catheter. And the catheter is then um, uh, pushed into the closed aqueduct, which can be seen here. Um, and it's very important to stay very close to the midline in order to have the midline um, where the um, catheter is pushed through the aqueduct and not uh, to perforate uh, into the mesencephalic tissue. Uh, we always re um, uh, we take the catheter back in order to have a look uh, if the direction was correctly uh, chosen. And then if this is correct, then we would uh, push the catheter all the way back in. Uh, and these are the post-operative images where you see the catheter with perforation holes here, perfor perforation holes here, connected to a reservoir and then to a shunt system. So one catheter and very simplified shunt system. This can be also um, shown in a little bit more complicated situation. Here you have a uh, one and uh, one year and four months old uh, girl, isolated fourth ventricle with post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus and post infectious condition. And here the uh, isolated fourth ventricle actually pushes all the way up um, to the uh, supertentorial area. And this membrane can be used. Uh, this was actually where the catheter was placed earlier. Uh, but this membrane can be used in order to place the catheter. So if there's no clear access into the third ventricle, if there's no clear anatomical landmark in order to target the aqueduct, we would choose in those cases the alternative route to go through the membrane of the floor of the lateral ventricle and then through the roof of the fourth ventricle in order to place uh, the stent. Here, um, with navigation, this uh, can be identified. And here we are already in the room uh, between both layers of membrane and uh, the floor of the lateral ventricle was already opened. You have some veins. Uh, we have done a second opening in the lower layer, which is the roof of the fourth ventricle. And then the catheter is just placed um, through here, uh, through this second perforation. And here you can see post-operative imaging, the tip of the catheter is here, the perforation holes proximally are located here, and then again connected to the shunt system. Um, our series, which was published in 2012, showed that uh, by this technique, using either aqueductoplasty or interventriculostomy, we could um, uh, diminished the size of the fourth ventricle over long time periods. So it was a constant success. 
in terms of relieving the pressure of the fourth ventricle and also the decompression of the brainstem uh, showed a wider diameter over long term uh, until 24 months of follow-up. In terms of symptoms, here you can see all different kinds of symptoms. They can be various. Uh, and we could see that all symptoms which were considered to be acute, so lower than four weeks of existence, uh, could be treated with 100% success. However, long-term uh, and chronic symptoms, which we know that these the patients are very complex, this, sometimes disabled patients, uh, could not be treated uh, with, with the same success rate. If you perform this kind of um, stent placement in very young children, then with the growth of the head, uh, the catheter can be uh, retracted passively. And here you can see the same tip, which was then shown 10 months afterwards. The tip was located here, just due to the growth of the head. And these needs to be uh, replaced. Uh, here you can see a replacement of the shunt. And we have done a similar case, post hemorrhagic hydrocephalus first, uh, normal shunt, then putting a stent, which you can see here in ultrasound, and then the catheter was retracted over time. And there you can also use very nicely the shunt scope uh, because now you have an open aqueduct and you just put the, vent uh, the ventricular catheter into the aqueduct uh, with the shunt scope. And um, this has the big advantage that you can um, define the length of the catheter. First, we retract the um, uh, shunt scope again to look that the, uh, the aqueduct did not um, get any injury by our, by our maneuver. And then we go all the way down to the floor of the fourth ventricle uh, and then retract the shunt scope and get the perfect length, uh, which then never can be retracted for further growth again. So, um, uh, so far for the isolated ventricles, and then we get uh, to a more complex uh, situation, the multi-leculated hydrocephalus. As we all know, they are linked to a very severe infections in neonates. Um, and this was a three months old with post-hemorrhagic, post-infectious hydrocephalus and development of multi-cystic compartments. These compartments were really aggressive. Um, however, the child was not in such a bad uh, state uh, as the MRI looked like. And uh, those conditions are very hard to treat because you lose interventricularly any kind of anatomical landmarks. Uh, and thus, uh, navigation and endoscopy together are really mandatory in order to find uh, your trajectories, in order to find your locations of fenestrations, uh, which can be defined preoperatively. And it's already a challenge to preoperatively plan the right entry point in order to get with one entry point all fenestrations um, and then placing not more than two ventricular catheters in those patients, connect them with a Y connector, one valve, and then one peritoneal catheter. So um, basically, in, uh, in those cases, endoscopy is uh, to simplify the shunt and make those uh, patients uh, to avoid any kind of two sh uh, shunt systems in parallel, as well as uh, avoiding uh, any situation which you can basically not follow up because you don't know if there are complex situations, uh, what kind of shunts are really working and whatnot. This was a 24 months uh, old follow up image. You can see severe damage to the brain, of course, but uh, stabilized hydrocephalus treated with the shunt system. So, this is the thing which we would like to avoid not to shunt system, as minimal amount of catheters. Um, here we have only two ventricular catheters one Y connector, one valve, one peritoneal um, catheter. Uh, and this uh, are sometimes patients which we get. Uh, this was a very complex patient, 2.5 years with post-hemorrhagic, post-infection condition, multi-located hydrocephalus transferred after nine surgeries, two MRIs, six CT scans, and 36 X-rays, and then uh, four different external ventricular drainages. And out of this condition, we uh, first started with consequent antibiotic therapy until the CSF was clean. And then uh, we planned our trajectories and performed these uh, perforations in order to get um, a fenestration to the uh, aseptostomy, actually to the contralateral side, and then doing fenestrations here all the way uh, in order to get the fourth ventricle and these cysts connected. And uh, then basically, uh, the whole uh, system could be um, treated with one ventricular catheters, 
and one shunt system to keep this uh, stabilized in a quite stable condition. Uh, as I said earlier, it's, these are complex um, conditions. We are able with the technique of navigation and uh, endoscopy together in order to uh, drain uh, up to nine compartments in our series, which we published in 2010. Uh, and we could see that using the navigation could end up the long way of revisions in those patients in order to get a stable uh, situation. But you can see how many surgeries a patient can get. So um, to prevent the condition is very much important. And what we do more and more since uh, 2010 is doing neuroendoscopic lavage uh, for post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus as well as for post-infectious hydrocephalus. Uh, that we introduce uh, the endoscope, putting irrigation to one tube, um, passive outflow through the other tube in order to get clear view and then an aspiration of the clots. Um, because the clots are often uh, the reason to cause shunt occlusions and then shunt revisions will cause shunt infections and then we end up with multiloculations. Uh, which can also uh, be caused by the blood itself. And getting the blood out is one uh, thing which we can avoid. Uh, we can also diminish the amount of shunts, uh, but uh, more importantly, we had in our treatment group with the Lavage no multiloculated hydrocephalus, however, one isolated fourth ventricle. So this is something we definitely see still, but we don't see the severe multiloculations anymore. Uh, the same is true for ventriculitis. You have a severe ventriculitis with a lot of uh, poos in the ventricles, sepsis after uh, staph epidermidis, uh, and serratia meningitis and hydrocephalus. We did endoscopic lavage at eight weeks of a premature baby uh, after birth with uh, the uh, body weight of 1,800 grams. Stabilized the condition first with a the rickham, then put a shunt. Um, and with this technique, we can also diminish the shunt rate, not as much as in post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, but what, what is more important, we can definitely diminish the amount of revision rates within 24 months, and we can diminish the amount of reinfection rates significantly. So lavage plays a very important role as well as diminishing the rate of multiloculated hydrocephalus. Then at the end, I will talk about some cysts. Um, Posing hydrocephalus, where we sometimes look at and don't really know what to do. And this is a posterior fossa arachnoid cyst causing large hydrocephalus. And we normally do in those patients that we access the posterior fossa, again with navigation, in order to get fenestration and then uh, treat this condition just with the fenestration of the arachnoid cyst and treat um, um, uh, without a shunt and just by fenestration. Another condition is uh, qu lamina quadrigemina uh, cyst. This patient had just minor headaches and was followed up over time. And finally, after six months, the mother uh, decided for surgery. And those uh, kind of cysts definitely don't need to uh, put any stents just to do a fenestration. You need an anterior um, access hole, uh, navigation in order to access the ventricle, and to find your a point of fenestration, and then we fenestrate uh, the cyst um, at the ipsilateral side as well as the, at the contralateral side um, uh, in order to get um, yeah, um, the, the walls um, perforated and communicating the inner parts with the ventricles. Here you can see the postoperative uh, imaging. Um, last case with a tumor. Uh, cyst and also loculation. Here's a tumor cyst causing a compression of the third ventricle, small contrast enhancement, a nodule, 14 year old um, boy with a spastic hemiparesis, which develops slowly over time. Um, and here in this case, uh, we did a contralateral approach to the contralateral uh, ventricle, went to the third ventricle, and then opened up the um, uh, the uh, inner wall of the third ventricle. I can proceed the video. Uh, here we are already in the cyst. Here's the foramen of Monroe. This is the uh, medial wall of the third ventricle with a membrane of the cyst. This is open, and here you can see the protein uh, liquid coming out of the tumor cyst. And then the nodule is taking uh, with a forceps piece in a piecemeal technique, and uh, the patient is now in follow up without any uh, problems. Um, of growing tumor uh, for two years. 
uh, we put a stand. Um, why we, did we put a stand? Because here you can see that the tissue is growing again, that we were uh, not uh, sure if this uh, tumor still grows uh, some liquid and um, the um, uh, recurrence of the cyst would occur. So the a stand could again um, establish the communication between uh, the cyst and the ventricles in order to have a persistent success. So in summary, uh, I would uh, like to remind you on the scheme and uh, using endoscopy uh, together with shunts or endoscopy alone, alone or endoscopic uh, lavage uh, in different circumstances, as I explained earlier. Um, and uh, treatment of hydrocephalus in children with neuroendoscopy should be standard of care, complementary, not competitive approach for shunting and endoscopy together in this case, to avoid shunt or uh, its complications and to simplify the shunt systems. And uh, there should be a tailored approach for planning and guiding uh, navigation. So the final take-home message is that the training for this kind of uh, intervention is essential, of course, but planning and navigation is the key for sustainable success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ehrlich. That was absolutely amazing. Some of the technology you were showing, I'm very envious of, uh, especially the augmented reality that was, was spectacular. Um, a question that came through while you were talking uh, was about the isolated fourth ventricular endoscopy. Uh, the question was, do you use a separate hole or a separate... Uh, oh, oh, that's right. Sorry. I was reminded that you have to stop sharing your screen so that we can come back on. Yeah, actually, I'm trying to uh, stop uh, here. Maybe this one? Yeah. Yep, perfect. Okay. Um, the question that came through was about the fourth ventricular endoscopy and whether you use a separate hole and a separate trajectory to insert the ventricular catheter while you're doing the surgery. Uh, no, it's always the same uh, entry point and the same per hole. So um, what we do is if we... Uh, um, have the endoscopy, we take away the working sheet and we only use the optic. And then the diameter of the endoscope becomes much smaller and we have enough space in order to uh, guide the catheter in parallel to the, to the optic. Uh, and then we can guide uh, together, uh, first in parallel, and then later on we proceed the catheter along just almost parallel to the optic uh, direction. Yeah, that's, that's an important point I want to echo, and that is there's this notion that you can pass the catheter through the working portal of some of these scopes, which becomes very difficult, and you can't keep it in place if you try and retract the scope, even if it were compatible. So we do the same thing. I, I take off the sheath, just use the optics by themselves through the cortical and subcortical path with the catheter passed directly next to it. And with the stylet and the catheter, you can usually navigate and direct it to where you want. Yeah, it's, an, it's an important point, a good question. Another question that I had for you was in regards to the preoperative planning. You mentioned the navigation, um, the, the imaging. Do you ever use a, a contrast dye or to see what's communicating with what so that you can maybe minimize the number of passes that you have to take? And, and yeah, how do you do that? A big issue of discussion. I know a lot of colleagues actually are using this. Uh, we try to avoid it. We try to um, use only the... Uh, cis sequence, which is the high contrast T2 weighted uh, sequences in order to uh, visualize all small membranes. And with these membranes, we can actually um, uh, find our targets quite easily. And then we uh, use really reconstructed imaging. It's not like that we are using uh, rigid coronal, um, acetal or axial imaging, but we are using the inline views. We put a trajectory and then we use the inline views and then we can perfectly see uh, if we can get along with our endoscopy along uh, this trajectory which we plan and optimize <coughs> it as long as it is as perfect as we want to have it. Wonderful. Well, thank you.